Good evening. Welcome to worship. Uh, a couple of quick announcements. Uh, the first one is next week we are putting the, the final, final touches on the parking lot. Still not quite all the way done, but don't worry, it will not be anything like it was this summer. Uh, we just need to do some landscaping around the edge. So if you come to church at all next week, please just kind of park in the middle and away from the edges. That way, uh, when the landscapers are here, they can uh, do whatever it is they need to do and nobody's car will, will be in the way. Also this evening at worship, and, and all of our worship services this, this weekend as we begin this new time of, of ministry, we'll be uh, having a special uh, prayer and blessing for those in the congregation who serve as uh, leaders in any capacity, an, an elder, a church council member, those who are teachers of Bible study and Sunday school teachers. So there, it's in your bulletin, but right after the Apostles' Creed and right before the prayers of the church, um, I will invite you forward if you serve in any of those capacities or multiple of those capacities, uh, come forward and we'll be praying for you this evening as well as at all the worship services this weekend. And with that, we begin our worship this evening with our opening hymn. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For 
for the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, our support and defense in every need, continue to preserve your church in safety, govern her by your goodness, and bless her with your peace. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. Alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia, Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark in the ninth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them, and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to Jesus and greeted him. And he asked them, What are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whatever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. And he answered them, O faithless generation, how long I am to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought him the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, immediately convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. And it was often cast him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, If you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out. And the boy was like a corpse, so that most of the men said, most of them said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? 
And he said to them, This kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Anyone who is at least my age, 40, um, has very distinct memories of the events of 23 years ago this past week. And when I think back to the events uh, of September 11th, the word that so often pops into my mind every single time that that I think about it is chaos. Because that's what it was. It was chaos. The, the chaos of, of the first responders trying to figure out what exactly they were going to do as they tackled uh, this, this impossible task. The chaos as you hear the stories of the victims who are trying to escape with, with their lives that day. On a micro level, there was still chaos going on. I think about what was going on being a, a senior in high school. The, the teacher's kind of wondering, well, are we supposed to keep teaching or not? And then just sort of whispering to each other between passing periods about who knows what. That in an era before, everyone had a cell phone. The, the constant call of people being called down to the office because their parents were on the phone or they were getting picked up from, from school. Or knowing that morning, I should have gotten up early to get gas before school, but shock of shock, as a 17-year-old, I didn't get up early to, to jump on that, so instead I had to get gas after school, and it jumped all the way up to the astonishing price of, I think, like $1.60. I know, it's unheard of, right? And there was lines around the block just waiting to, to put in a little bit. We all have those memories if we're a certain age or, or any other type of chaos, because we all have experienced 
chaos, hopefully not too close to home, but something we've at least witnessed and seen with our own eyes, whether it's on a, a grand scale like that or something smaller, we are all familiar with the, the idea of chaos. Things just kind of being out of control. The gospel lesson that I just shared with you demonstrates a, a chaotic moment. Peter, James, and John, and Jesus, if you actually look right before this in Mark's gospel, they're just coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration to this entire scene that is taking place where there is chaos. Jesus, uh, Jesus finds the other nine disciples arguing w w with the crowds and uh, with the scribes, and there's all these great crowds around them listening to what's going on. Perhaps they're yelling and arguing themselves and taking sides about who's right or who's wrong, or whatever else there was they're debating about. And if it couldn't get any more chaotic, what happens? This man approaches and says, I have this son, and he's been possessed by a demon. He does all of these terrifying things, and it's been happening to him since he's been a young man. You, know, you couldn't blame Peter, James, and John if they would have tugged on the sleeve of Jesus in that moment and said, let's go back up the mountain. Let's go back with Moses and Elijah and the Father. But they can't. They can't go back because it's these chaotic moments. It, it's the chaos that is life, which is why Jesus came. Because life is chaotic whether it's something horrifying that we, that we witnessed some years ago, or it's your life right now. The details are, are, are different, but let's be honest. Is your life neat and tidy and well-organized and everything always goes exactly why it should be? Or is it more chaotic? Is everything always going according to plan in your life? Or are you usually filled with interruptions and unexpected problems and arguments and troubles at home, problems at work and school and issues with, with family, betrayal by friends, maybe even betrayal by family, and so many other countless things, and you realize it's hectic and chaotic. And if you were here a few weeks back, I mentioned that as we kind of get into this fall season now, we get back into a time of, of routines. And I even said how, yes, routines can be a good thing. Routines are a comforting thing. But we all know the routines also can make life very chaotic. And I don't know if anybody ever hears the word chaos and says, chaos is a good thing. Chaos is a wonderful thing. Then why do we embrace it so much? And why do we wear it almost like it's a badge of honor? That we have so many important things going on. We, we have endless uh, school and, and work projects. We have, we have house projects and we have bills to pay and we have deadlines and we have mandatory practices and rehearsals and we have meeting after meeting after meeting and so many other things. We say, look at me. Look at all that I have going on. And maybe in those few moments... When we try to escape it, the ironic thing is we become stressed. I've got no time to sit down. I have no time to rest. No, there's still things to do. And if I do sit down, I even feel more stressed, right? Have you said that or thought that? I have. So we got to keep going. We, we have to keep, keep pushing forward. Because if we're not fully engaged in everything, or our children aren't fully engaged and involved in every single little thing, then we are lazy and we are unfulfilled, and we're not going to keep up with everybody else, and, and, and everybody else is going to pass us by, and the world will pass us by. And we even bring it up in casual conversation. Hey, how are you doing? Oh, hectic, busy, but I'm good, but everything's just real hectic right now. Really? Really? It's hectic, but, but good? Our chaos is a false god. Because what it is, it's actually the god of self. And that slowly creeps into, then what do I, I, what do I need God for? Or, quite honestly, I don't have time for God. That I can do this all, that I can figure it out, and I don't need anybody else. 
And at its core, then, chaos is a spiritual problem. That I put my faith and my trust in me and my world that I've created. But if I actually stop and take a step back, if I can actually force myself to hold still for a moment and put everything else aside and close everything else up and maybe literally sit in silence, it actually forces me to trust in God's provision, to trust that he's actually in control of all things and that he has say over own things, over all things. And these chaotic things, my busy life, the things that I think define me and that give me intrinsic value and worth are actually put aside. And I then can hopefully begin to see and trust that, simply know, that our value and our worth in God's eyes is seen through Jesus Christ. And it's not in what we do It's not in what we have, and it's not in how busy we are and how much I can do every single day. That was the problem with the disciples as well as they tried to heal this boy. Because Christ had sent them out other times as well to do these things, and they had been, for lack of a better term, successful. They had healed the sick. They had cast out demons. They'd seen Jesus do it countless times, and they figured they could just do it on their own, that they could be important, that they could be in charge, that Jesus was gone, he had gone up onto the mountain, and we can take care of it ourselves. And what happens when they believe they could take care of it themselves and things then didn't work out? Chaos. Chaos takes over. So Jesus comes down, Jesus heals the boy, and and later on in private, what do they ask Jesus? So why couldn't we do it? And the answer that, that Jesus gives is a real interesting one. It's where our gospel lesson ended. This kind of demon cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. What Jesus is telling his disciples, and how he's, to be honest with you, kind of chiding them in this moment, is that the disciples... We're all about the chaos. That in everything that was going on and all the things that were happening and their arguments and this boy that was possessed by a demon, they began to be confident in their own work. And the one thing that they didn't do should have been the first thing that they should have done. Go to God in prayer. Turn to the Father to say, you're in control. In the midst of all the chaos, in the midst of everything, you still rule over all things, you still watch over all things, you still control all things. And that's what they didn't do. Because what we have to understand about our God is our God is a God of order, not a God of chaos. Think about even the creation story. Go all the way back to Genesis chapter 2. In the midst of creating the universe, what does God do at the end after he's been so busy doing everything? He rests. He stops. He doesn't say, I've got to keep going. We've got to do more, 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 and more. He stops. So we ask ourselves the question, if God can stop if the creator of you and me and all of the universe can actually just stop for a moment, why can't you? Because when we embrace the chaos, what we're actually doing, and when we refuse to rest, we are in a sense saying that we are better than God and we know better than God. We know what's right for our lives and our family's lives and our children's life and everybody else. And that it's where we get the Hebrew word, or where we get our word Sabbath. It's from a Hebrew word. And yes, we mo- usually know it as the word rest, but it can also be translated as just stop, cease. There needs to be time for the chaos to cease and embrace God's good order. 
we're actually going to see actually part of that in, in our closing hymn for, for the, this evening. And it, it's a hymn from the hymnal, but maybe it's not one that you're super familiar with. And it was actually written on the one-year anniversary and in response to the attacks of September 11th. And when you sing those words at the end of worship this evening, think about what is actually being said and how there is a time for everything and how God's wisdom and God's desires trump everything about how we think things should be and how the world should be. So have you stopped? Are you willing to stop? Have you stopped to pray and to seek God's wisdom? Or are you going to continue to find your escape from the chaos and doing something else? More stuff, more time-consuming things, more self-medicating, or whatever it is that you think are actually helping, but in all reality are actually creating more chaos in your life. Because what God has actually done is he has created the Sabbath as a time to rest, a time to to stop. And yes, we do talk about our Sabbath rest as being in worship, being here, receiving the good gifts that God gives us, receiving and hearing the word, receiving the sacraments. But it's also about physically stopping as well. That God is in control. That our God actually gathers us together so we can just stop and he can serve us, and he can tell us who we are, what we are really worth, so he can heal us, so he can mend our broken hearts, so he can feed us with himself. So Jesus speaks to us today. Jesus speaks to us today just as he has spoken to his disciples, and he asks us the question, have you prayed? Or do you just go to the Father and say, give me a discerning heart, give me wisdom? You continue to go to your father. Have you let your father do the work, trusting that he's in charge? Because when we Sabbath, when we gather together, that's actually what happens in this place. God is doing all the work. God is giving to us when we gather together. And when we gather together in a very unpredictable and chaotic world, this is the one thing we can count on. These are, this is the place where predictable things happen that we are given peace that the world cannot give, that we are given forgiveness and love that the world cannot give, that there are no surprises when we Sabbath and when we rest and when we stop together, but rather the promises and the work of God that never change are given to us right here, and these are the things that then last into eternity. Not in a world of chaos, not an eternity of chaos, but a world and an eternity of peace that only God can give. In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. I would invite you to please stand now as we confess our Christian faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Together we confess, I believe in God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. The Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord God, we believe. Help our unbelief. Sustain us through the many troubles and trials of this world. When unclean spirits afflict us and those that we love, revive our trust in you. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you have given your beloved Son the tongue of one who is taught, that he may know how to sustain with the word those who are weary. Prosper in every place the preaching of your gospel. By your Spirit, enable your pastors to proclaim the word with clarity and joy. By the same Spirit, open the ears of your children to believe it with gladness and action. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, 
guard the tongues of our governing authorities, that they may not stumble in what they say, but speak wisely accord, leading in accord with your will. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, you have promised that all things are possible for one who believes. In such faith, we bring before you Mary Ann, Lorna, Karen, Linda, Bill, Vern, Carol, Marvine, Herb, and all those others in need, asking you to grant them health and healing. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, Heavenly Father, we gratefully remember the sufferings and death of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, for our salvation. Rejoicing in his victorious resurrection from the dead, we draw strength from his ascension before you, before he ever stands as our own high priest. Gather us together from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. For to you alone we give all glory, honor, and worship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, the fount of all wisdom, by your Holy Spirit enlighten those who teach and those who learn, that rejoicing in the knowledge of your truth, they may worship you and serve you from generation to generation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, grant to your church your Holy Spirit and the wisdom that comes down from above, that your word may not be bound but have free course and be preached to the joy and edifying of Christ's holy people so that in steadfast faith we may serve you and in the confession of your name abide unto the end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Taught by our Lord and trusting in his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated.